the way. There are lots of things that can be done there, which would create a whole new industry in Brazil. So I think that you just need to know, I think the pushback you will get there, it may come from the corn ethanol interest or others that are economically opposed to you, but it won't have any traction. In other words, you're going to get a great, much greater acceptance, I think, in this round of climate change negotiations than you did back in 98. I think you're going to make real headway. What people are worried about in Brazil is not do you have the most efficient biofuels in the world and wouldn't it be nice if we had it. Everybody knows that's true. No one can approach the 9 to 1 conversion ratio you have achieved. There are some biofuels uh, from cellulosic biofuels that are around 6 to 1 now and because of transportation differentials uh, the jatropha trees in Africa, for example, are quite attractive. And there are some places now in America that are looking at growing jatropha, but the problem is it won't stand any frost at all. So there are all kinds of other options out there. But your problem will be entirely internal. The, the world will say, well, if we let Brazil help us solve our problem at the price of more rainforest destruction, have we really gained anything? And that's what you have to answer. If you can find an answer to that problem, then I, I believe you'll see uh, some states, American states, for example, we talked about this earlier. Once we pass a, a cap and trade system in America, I think California will set it up so that there is an economic incentive to use uh, cane ethanol even with the 53 cent tax on it. And I think, keep in mind, I, I don't think you ought to get in an either-or thing with the electric cars. I think what you need to do is to say that a lot of countries can't afford to import electric cars and don't manufacture them. So for all those countries, biofuels is the best alternative. Then I think you should acknowledge that every country goes to hybrids before they go to full electric vehicles, and the hybrids should be electric and biofuel or biodiesel, not regular fuel and you should but you I wouldn't worry about the fact that the Israelis are going to subsidize the production of and the sales of a hundred thousand electric cars or that Mr. Tata in India is trying to figure out a way to produce an electric car that just for good measure goes around with a solar panel on the roof I mean who knows what's going to happen you just have to trust Brazilian innovation to keep making the changes necessary to stay ahead of the curve. But don't put yourself in opposition to the electric cars. Just say that, that for the foreseeable future, you're going to be able to reach places that electric motors won't go. And, and focus on, I'm telling you what the problem is going to be in the International Forum. The International Forum's problem will be, if we let Brazil help us solve our problem, we'll make their problem worse. If you can answer that question, I think you'll see very broad acceptance. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I often say I'm all for electric cars. We make electricity here, too, in our industry. So, um, Sun, I was looking through the papers over the weekend, and Sunday's Washington Post talked about uh, a long piece on President Obama's energy policy and really talked about how he's elevated the issue of energy and climate change really to the top of his agenda by talking about green jobs. And... Uh, you know, I, as you know, I work for Vice President Gordon, so I'm a little bit on the Internet to probably too much. But I noticed that when you were in Spain the other day, uh, at least the Spanish press tried to suggest that you were saying that you, know, you were agreeing with some that say that pushing green jobs is actually not, may cost other jobs. Uh, actually, I, I, looked, one, I looked over the transcript. That's not what you said. Yeah, actually, and I wanted I to said, give you a chance to respond to I that. I said precisely the reverse. There exactly. was a, a study done by a business group in Spain claiming that the extraordinary subsidies given by Spain to green energy had cost twice as many jobs as it had created. And the subsidy gave, it received a sort of willing ear now because the Spanish economy is in the tank, like much of Europe. And I disputed that. I said, look, I haven't seen the study, but I said, just inherently, I don't think that's true. Keep in mind, before the current collapse, Spain had created an, millions of new jobs and had very low unemployment rate and 4% growth, which for a European country is pretty good. 
And what happened to them was they got hit the same way the UK and Ireland did. They were building housing on a trajectory that assumed the next five years would equal the last 10. So they, when, when the, all the financing institutions got in trouble and all the instruments of residential construction were called into question, the states that had, that had projected the future based on the past got in trouble in the same way that the American states of Nevada and Arizona crashed first because they had the highest rate of residential housing growth in the previous few years. It was much more than speculation. It was assuming that tomorrow will be as good as yesterday. But I, I just don't think there's a shred of evidence that supports the fact that Spain and Portugal succeeded, for example, in generating centralized solar power through solar thermal, made a big contribution to their collapse. And when there's a comeback and oil goes over $100 a barrel again, Spain's going to look very smart. And all the people that did that study are going to have egg on their face. <laughs> Appreciate that. I, I, I thought I read your remarks correctly. Uh, I want to talk about two questions uh, here now. One, today, General Motors filed for Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy protection. That symbol of American might is now worth less than, I guess, a dollar a share. Yet here in Brazil, GM has been growing very well. Like China, GM is doing very well in Brazil. As with other automakers here, 90% of the new cars they sell here in Brazil, GM, are flex fuel cars. In fact, it may even be higher just for GM. From your vantage point, what went wrong in GM? And is there anything about GM's experience in Brazil that may be positive as the company tries to think restructuring? Well, I think that the automakers were hurt by... Um a series of miscalculations, including political ones, over the years. When I was president, there was a bipartisan consensus in Congress determined to stop us from raising the mileage standard. The automakers' unions would go in and work on the Democrats, and the automaker executives would go in and work on the Republicans, and they would tell them that uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore were crazy to try to mandate higher mileage, it, Americans wouldn't buy those cars and it would lead to massive layoffs. And they basically tried to preserve the status quo and put all their energy into uh, to, uh, producing SUVs and other heavy high mileage cars for which there was a momentary gap. They also fundamentally left a lot of their cost structure intact. So they got in a lot of trouble. Second problem that America has though is aggravated by what's happened in Brazil. That is, there is now, quite apart from the momentary difficulties our automakers have, keep in mind Saab in Switzerland, I mean in Sweden just failed. There is a global overcapacity of automobile manufacturing because everybody wants to get in and make their own cars now. And Ford has done unusually well because they have positioned themselves well in all these countries, including China, to make cars to the local market. And General Motors, as you pointed out, has done some of the same thing. So that's a big problem. A third problem they had is that uh, their benefits for retirees were enshrined in an era when America had a monopoly on the local market. And because the business community joined with the health insurance community to kill health care reform, uh, when I was president, they allowed another 15 years to go by where we're paying more uh, for the most expensive health care in the world that is the only system that doesn't cover everybody and gets worse outcomes. So uh, one of my friends used to joke that he, who was a General Motors executive, he said, he was a guy in the healthcare business who produced cars on the side. So these things have, so I think that, that the administration in general has done quite a good job with this automobile business. It's very tough. I should make full disclosure. My, my family was in the Buick business when I was a boy growing up. I was under a car uh, when I was six years old. I could change the oil in the car 
at seven when back when a real person could repair his own car. Nobody can do that anymore. It's, it's all covered up. But <laughs> I think I know everything that's good and bad. The American automobile dealers have gotten, uh, automobile producers have gotten better in the last few years. They're producing higher quality cars. But they're going to have to go through this because of global changes and the residue of problems that built up over decades. And when they come out, if we do it right, General Motors will be a strong company. Chrysler will be a successful merged company. Ford will do even better. And uh, the world will have an automobile structure more in line with the number of cars people can possibly buy every year all across the globe. That's what I hope will happen. And in the process, we'll move toward uh, more clean energy cars. Well, last question. You're a fantastic student and appreciator of history. As you look back from the beginning of American history to today, who's your favorite Secretary of State? Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> no, <I could>. you <laughs> My personal favorite is the currently serving one. But uh, I think, let me take that as a serious question. America's mission from the beginning was not to interfere in the affairs of other countries, but to try to be a good partner and a good friend and to perfect our own democracy, that if we were a good example, that would have a big say. Uh, beginning at the dawn of the 20th century, when, by the way, Europe and the U.S. were as trade dependent as they are today, before World War I, we began to be involved in the rest of the world. And every time we extended our power through military or commercial means, for every friend we made, we had people thinking we had gone a step too far. So we have had to measure this all throughout now more than 100 years. Uh, I think it's clear that in the last eight years we became too unilateral. We had very good relations with Brazil and with Latin America when I was president, not because the government of Brazil agreed with every decision the United States made when I was president, but because you thought we had the right model, that we wanted to share the future, and we didn't think we had all the answers, and we thought we had to work together. That's the sort of government you have again today. And the legacy of the President and the Secretary of State is yet to be made. But I, I just believe that when good people have the right ideas and are working within the right framework, good things tend to happen. So I think if we work together and we save our grandchildren for the worst consequences of climate change, that's quite a legacy. If we work together and we prove that once we get through this financial crisis, we can have an economic model in Latin America and in the United States that not only generates wealth, it does not increase inequality because there are so many new jobs and so many businesses and because all of our people have access to education, that's quite a legacy. And the more we do that, the more those kids who represented all the different faces of Brazil will be the face of the future. That is, our differences will matter less than our common humanity. That's what these people ought to be thinking about. Get the right model and try to make something good happen every day, and your legacy will take care of itself. Just make something good happen. And that's what you have to think about in climate change. You know, there's not going to be one silver bullet, but if we know it's a problem and we're determined to have the right result, the rest of us should just worry about making something good happen every day. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you.